All right. Um, if you don't know me, I'm John Racanelli with the Landmarks Committee for Sabre. We're here tonight to talk about the Sabre Landmarks map featuring the graves. At this point, everything on this map has been provided by Fred Worth, and I can't thank him enough for being gracious enough to provide us with all the information. Um, just in talking briefly before getting started this evening, he has now made 9,500 different graves that he has visited personally. And I think by the point that he provided us with the information, he was about 9,400. So we've got a ton of stuff on the map. So I'm hoping if you're here, you're a member of the committee, you've used the Sabre baseball map. We wanted to make sure that we were able to have all of this information available at any point, but it just seemed like with over 9,400, at least at that point, if we were to put this on the regular map, it was just going to inundate it. And we thought it would be a better idea to make a completely separate map that would include all of the graves for anybody that has been involved with Major League Baseball, the American Girls Baseball, Negro League Baseball, executives, and so forth. So if you look at the regular map, the flagship map, you're going to see that there are graves on there. It's going to be Hall of Famers. And each year we will be adding by vote any other graves that warrant being on that map because of specific notoriety. For instance, this past year, uh, the vote resulted in adding uh, Ted Double Duty Radcliffe, who's buried here in Chicago, and uh, Shoeless Joe Jackson, who obviously is famous enough to warrant being included. So at this point, I just kind of wanted to show you a little bit of what the map looks like. I'm hoping everybody has kind of seen it, but as far as the map itself is concerned, if you open up the map, you're gonna see all of these blue circles and each of those blue circles represents by that number, the amount of graves that Fred has visited in that specific area. So if we were to go look at the New York area, for instance, as you click on each of these blue circles, it's going to get you in closer and closer. Um, I'm not really sure exactly where this is now that I'm in so close, but this grave, um, this graveyard here, there's three. And if you go to each of these little buttons, you click on the button, you're going to see um, Hector Wagner, somebody that I've never heard of, but apparently was significant because it was Fred's 6,000th grave. So that's pretty cool. Um, the orange one is different. That's Frank Grant. That means he's a Hall of Famer. And uh, William Zitzman. So I don't know who that is either. But um, as you kind of are able to zoom around the map, you're going to see that he has been to so many places. It's almost uh, dizzying. So but if you are familiar with the map too, on the regular map, you're going to find that there are going to be less things on this particular one than are available on the regular map. But one of the things we're hoping is that people will help us fill those missing parts in. Especially we're looking for photographs of each of the graves, which is going to be a Herculean task considering how many different there are. And we would like to eventually link for anybody that has a Sabre bio, link to the bio so that somebody going to the map can find pretty quickly the information about that person, assuming they have a bio already done. So one of the things that is pretty cool is, for instance, here in Chicago, you can see Wrigley Field is right here, little Clark and Addison. There's gonna be two here that are shown it's going to be Ron Santo and Charlie Grimm. Those are showing, they're pretty close. They should be actually at Wrigley Field because their ashes were scattered there. But you're going to find those throughout the areas as you go and look at specific pins. If you kind of, kind of go down into Lake Michigan, you're going to find this one here. Here's Bill Vec Jr., ashes scattered in Lake Michigan. So Fred has been unbelievably thorough in terms of locating all of these graves and putting in their sites even if they're unmarked, even if they are just ashes scattered and so forth. But the cool I should, let me quickly add, sure. uh, some of them, um, 
cemeteries know the guy is there but have no idea where in their grounds he is and so in ones like that i typically for the gps just put it pretty much dead center of the cemetery because that's the best i can guess okay yeah but even so like when we get to graceland cemetery which is shown here this is just a few blocks north of wrigley field the amazing part about the gps is going to show you not only who's there but specifically the locations of this huge cemetery where those graves are located. So the orange ones, again, are going to be Hall of Famers. Ernie Banks is right here by the water. And if you go to this and you hit Street View, some cemeteries actually will have had Google go through. And if you hit the Street View, you're going to be able to see the gravestone right there. So Mr. Cubs is pretty cool. If you've been there recently during the summer, there's ivy that grows on it. They, whoever has been taking care of it has done a really good job of doing that. Uh, William Holbert is over here. It doesn't have a street view, as you can see. So that means that there is not a photograph of it. Uh, there's other ones here. Uh, Bob Carruthers is a grave that was actually rededicated through Saber and the 19th Century Grave Committee. Um, I'm not sure how good this is going to show it, but um, in any event, you can kind of play around with it and see even before you get to a specific place where each of the graves are that you want to visit. Say, for instance, you want to see Art Wilson or Fred Cohn, and you're like, I don't even know who Fred Cohn is. I'm not going to waste my time with that. Or you're like, I only want to see the Hall of Famers or so forth. This is going to give you almost you know, pinpoint within, I'd say, five to 15 feet, Fred. Is that usually about how close you, you get? That I, I usually try to let my GPS get me that close. Sometimes because of atmospheric conditions, it doesn't get that close. But it's still going to get you in the right acre. Yeah. So if you've if you've ever done this before, you where you've gone to a uh, grave site or a, a cemetery and you're not finding the grave. It may take a few minutes of walking around, but I have been amazed at how accurate Fred's information is. And I don't know if Stu Thornley is on here. He's got information that I, th I think Fred, he might've gotten from you or maybe he got on his own. I'm not sure, but um, you know, between the two of you and what you guys have done in terms of um, publishing the information about where all the grave sites are located. It's been a huge help for anybody that hopefully at this point has used the map or like me who has tried to test it out and make sure that the information we have is accurate. So, so that's kind of the way this works. Um, at this point, all we have really to differentiate the two kinds of gravestones are the red markers and the orange markers signifying only orange being Hall of Fame and red being not Hall of Fame. One of the things that I'd like to do, and I'm hoping that everybody will kind of do some input, I want to send out um, an email to the committee members for ideas on how better to differentiate between these. Um, I don't know if it makes sense to, say, for instance, have a specific color marker for um, the Women's Baseball League, if it makes more sense to have somebody that maybe was just an executive but not necessarily a player if it makes more sense to have the Negro Leagues differentiated or 19th century differentiated or so forth. I think one of the ideas I was hoping is that we could kind of brainstorm amongst each other and determine what would be the best way to differentiate those things so that you're able to look for what you're trying to find. But that's basically kind of how the map works. I don't know if anybody has used it yet. Um, I'm hoping you have. Um, I heard from a couple people and I saw some photographs coming to Sabre 51 here in Chicago and going home from Sabre 51 here in Chicago that um, they used at least the baseball map. Hopefully they used this map too and found it to be helpful. So that's just kind of the basics of this. I was just hoping, Fred, you might be able to introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about who you are, what the origin story is for anybody that doesn't know. and kind of give us the backstory on how you have been able to visit at this point 9500 graves it's pretty amazing well uh, i back in 2004 i'm a college professor i teach mathematics and i was having a rather stressful semester not nearly as stressful as some have had the past couple of years but 
for them it was stressful. And uh, so I wanted to just get out of town a little bit. And I happened to have been playing around on Frank Russo's website. If you're not familiar with it, you should be. Um, the deadballera.com, not devoted to 1901 to 1919, but dedicated to dead ball players. And uh, from that, I knew that Travis Jackson, who's in the Frankie Frisch, uh, Friends of Frankie Frisch wing of the Hall of Fame, um, was buried in Waldo, Arkansas, which is about an hour from where I lived in Arkansas. And so I decided, hey, I'll just take a day trip down there and uh, find the grave. And I very naively went down there. And since it was a small cemetery, that worked. Um, not all cemeteries are that small. Spring Grove in Cincinnati is 700 acres. And so you're not going to find things by just going into the cemetery and walk. And I know, I know Sam knows that because you, you've been to quite a few as well. You, you don't just go into a cemetery and start walking around and looking, even if you know there's a marker. Um, I started trying to find Schoolboy Row, and that was a lot harder because that cemetery was a good bit larger. Um, but I, I found a couple. I found out there were some more in the area. And you mentioned, uh, John, that this, there were some of those that you had never heard of. Um, I remember it was Dave, I think it was Dave Smith from Retro Sheet told me that 28% of guys who played major league ball played no more than one season. So even if you are a big time baseball fan, the, most of these guys you're never going to have heard of. Stu Thornley goes to Hall of Famers. I go to anybody. My favorite example of somebody like that is um, Bob Mavis, who I'm sure you've all heard of. Right. His entire major league career, he was with the Tigers. Oh, I want to say 1938. That's just me trying to remember. That could be, that could be off by 20 years. And uh, Tigers are playing the Yankees late in the season. Tigers are down a couple of runs. Ninth inning, a guy got on. Mavis goes into pinch run at first. He advances to second. Game ended. So his entire major league career was jogging 90 feet. But he played major league ball. I never did. So uh, yeah, he still gets my respect. But that's an example of the kind of – I mean, I'll, I'll visit, if they played major league ball, uh, I do um, I take some liberty since I'm the one deciding which ones I'm going to visit. I have some on the list that are, are I categorize as other. And um, one of those is Bob Davids, uh, who was one of the founders of Sabre. Um, I want to say he's in Arlington National Cemetery. I may not be remembering right. I think he is. Um, another one is Mike Dugan, who most of you have probably never heard of. But if you've ever been to Hot Springs, Arkansas, and seen the baseball trail there, you've seen some of the fruits of his labor. He was a dear friend, and he didn't get near as much credit as he should have, but did a wonderful job of helping Hot Springs get to where it could publicize its history as a great spring training site for Major League Baseball. And he passed away a couple of years ago, very suddenly, um, from a brain tumor. And so I visited his, and I count it. Oh, but he's not famous. That's okay. It's my list. I can count whoever I want. Um, one that I found interesting when you first opened up the map, uh, I, th I think there were only three individual graves that you could see on that first image. But one of them was Harmon Killebrew, which is sort of cool. Um, when I visited Killebrew, his grave was not marked because he hadn't died all that. It's in Payette, Idaho, right near the uh, state line. Uh, and so the actual photos that I have of that, I, I, I do have photos of every single grape I visited. At this point, I'm not quite willing to share all my photos. <laughs> but, uh, and it would take quite a while to ship them all to you anyway. Um, but his widow actually took the pictures that I have in my photo albums. And you said something that you wouldn't know, you wouldn't have reason to know wasn't quite correct. You said I'd personally visited all 9,500 of them. That's actually not true. There are two that I haven't. Uh, the one in England. Uh, Harry Watkins, I think is his name. He was a manager for the Giants in 1895. Um, I've never been to England, but a friend of mine said, hey, I'm going to England. Is there anybody you want me to visit for you? So he, he did that for me. And uh, Ken Caminiti. 
Uh, he is on a ranch that he co-owned with Craig Biggio. And through a friend, I got in touch with Craig Biggio and told him, you tell me what, tell me the time you want me there to take me out to the grave. I'll meet you there. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. But as long as you promise to never publish the photos, I'll take pictures of it and send them to you. Huh. So the pictures I have for that were taken by Craig Biggio. And I have honored his request. I'm not uh, sharing that. Um, there's also one that I think that I deliberately didn't give to you because there is one that I was sworn to secrecy on the location. Um, we were trying to find out where the ball player was buried and a Sabre bio was published by his grandson. And so I contacted the grandson. I mean, what better way to find out? And he said, well, yeah, um, his ashes were scattered, but I, unless you promise not to publicize it at all, I'm not going to tell you why. I'm not, not going to tell you where. I said, well, okay, I'll, you know, I'll be happy to do it. Um, and and I, I won't violate your trust. Um, the ashes were scattered in the backyard of his mother's, the ball player's daughter's house. That house is now a rental house, and she's concerned that if anybody knew ashes were scattered in the backyard, they wouldn't want to rent it. And so, at least as long as his mother is alive, I'm, yeah, and and I'm not going to call him to ask how his mom is. Um, I'm I'm not going to public. I, I mean, he he gave me the address of the house. I went to the house. I, I took pictures from the street. I don't I don't risk getting arrested for trespassing going into somebody's backyard in a situation like that. But um, I, I I do have a picture of that. But that's one that I, you know, out of personal integrity, I'm not gonna not gonna share. So basically, it turned from seeing Travis Jackson and hun hunting down Schoolboy Row into a full blown research project, research yeah. obsession. What was it about finding those two graves that you found so compelling? It was just fun. And for a while, I'd, I'd just, I'd take a day trip somewhere around Arkansas um, or East Texas or down in Louisiana a little bit. I don't remember when I first started spending the night places uh, going to, um, yeah, um, Marv Thronebury, uh, his brother Faye is in the same cemetery. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure they're in the same cemetery. Uh, I, I can check real quickly. But um, eventually I started taking trips. Yeah, they're they're both in the same cemetery. Um, and the trips started getting increasingly longer. The longest one we've taken in 2021, um, my, my wife and I were uh, um, on the road for nine weeks. Um mostly Ohio and Michigan, but also various other places. Those were the two that I had only done a few in before, and we picked up all the rest. And Ohio's got about 600. There are a lot in Ohio. Uh, we were on the road for nine weeks. I so drove 17,000 miles. We got to 1,157 graves on that trip and visited the grandkids as part of the process. So that was <laughs> nice. So what do you do when you get to a place – and it's just after visiting hours, the gates are closed. What have you, have you <laughs> done anything, scaled a wall, gone under a chain, anything like that? Um, I was in El Paso one time. Um, the Cohen brothers, there are two, two Cohens who played a little bit of Major League Ball. Uh, and they are in the Jewish cemetery in El Paso. And it's not a real nice part of town. Uh, that's the case with a lot of these cemeteries. They're not in the nicest parts of town very often. Uh, I got there about 2.59 in the afternoon, which normally would mean you still have plenty of time. Well, the, the workers were locking the gates because apparently that cemetery, they lock it at three. And I said, wait, don't don't lock it. I, I have a couple of graves I want to find. Oh, you, you can go in. We'll lock you in. And then when you're done, climb out. Said, okay. They said I could. <laughs> um, so I left my wife and the car outside the gate i wasn't you know obviously i wasn't going to drive in and um i i di it didn't take me too long to find him then i got back to the it's about a four or five foot high stone wall kind of thing uh, i did take a peek over the wall to see if there were any police there because if they caught me climbing over i'd say well they said i could i didn't know how likely they would be to believe that or if they would arrest me 
Um, in Mar uh, Maryland and in Delaware, I almost got locked in cemeteries in each of those. Um, got back to the gate just as the local person who was hired by the cemetery to lock the gates was getting ready to lock them. Uh, a friend of mine, um, some of you may be familiar with Bill Lee, and um, uh, he, he he wrote the book, the Baseball Necrology or something like that, and he, he's become a good friend. Uh, and he and his wife were down in Shreveport do, visiting some graves, and they actually did get locked in. The um, He called the police. And they came and they called the cemetery, but they couldn't get anybody. They contacted every number they could think of to try to get somebody. And the police couldn't contact anybody. So the police pulled bolt cutters out of their trunk and cut the lock off the cemetery gate to get the guy out of the cemetery. I, I saw the note on um, uh, Charlie Buffington and Lizzie Borden. I don't remember who uh, who posted that. Uh, I, I do visit other famous, again, I, I define it the way I define it other famous people when I visit graves, Lizzie Borden, I did visit when I was in that cemetery uh, because she's actually on my family tree. And so, you know, and she was acquitted. She's, she's not an ax murderer. She was acquitted. Wow. At least that's, that's what the official record says. Okay. Um, but yeah, in doing that, I do, like I said, I do visit others. I've been to 32 of the presidents and things like that. So with all of the places that you've been, before, say, for instance, you provided us with this information to use, how did you go about finding where all of these graves were? Well, like I said, when I first went, I'd go to the cemetery and walk around and look until I found it. Wow. Um, but it didn't take too long to realize that's not a good idea. Uh, big cemetery. Now, with some cemeteries, it's easy. The, na the um, National Cemetery is easy. You go on um, gravelocator.com va.gov or something like that um and they've got a wonderful database of all the national cemeteries and they show maps and in most of those cemeteries the locations are engraved on the backs of all the stones and grave one is next to grave two which is next to grave three and so on but there have been about three sections in different cemeteries the worst one was in i can't remember if it was national or chattanooga and I went in looking for the grave I was looking for. And grave one was next to grave 906, which was next to grave 2,407. And apparently in that section, that one section, that was the only section of that cemetery where they did it. Apparently, I'm guessing grave one was the first person who was buried in that section. Then grave two was the second person who was buried in that section, regardless of where they put them. So grave one and grave two could be 150 yards apart. So I went up to the office and asked the woman there. I said, I'm having trouble finding a grave. And she thought, oh, this will be easy. Because uh, then she said, well, which section? Um, section M. And you could just see her face. It's like, oh, no. She pulled out a map that was the size of a small dining room table. And the two of us just started looking on that map till we found the right lot number. But in most cases, I will do a lot of phone calls ahead of time. I'll go to findagrave.com to find pictures of the markers because it's a lot easier to find a marker if you know what it looks like. Uh, if the cemetery has a website, I'll go on there. And some of them are fantastic. Um, Arlington National Cemetery is great. Um, you can get I mean, it, it'll show you down uh, the, with the GPS all the way down to the, exactly where the person is. And there are other cemeteries, not just national ones that, that do that. Uh, I'll, I'll call the office if they have one. And I'll ask them if they have maps that they could email to me. And, and many of them do. And so I'll get all that information that I can. Uh, Billiongraves.com is another site that is, is fairly useful for that. They do a lot of GPS. And most of the time, they're right. Uh, they're not always right. Um, they had Duke Snyder about three blocks east of where he actually was. But I was able to figure out there was just one digit in the GPS that was wrong. And so I took a wild guess. Why don't we just put that there and see where that puts it? It put, put me in the cemetery, and it was actually pretty close to right. Um, so when, when I do go on trips, I've got a fairly large stack. That, that 1,100 grave trip, 
I literally had about 18 inch high stack of papers with maps and such. So it, I, I do a whole lot more work ahead of time than I do when I get there. Most of the time, uh, I'm in the cemetery for about five minutes per grave. Wow. How about any ones that you've done research on, you've gone to the cemetery and you just can't find it? Do you have like a most wanted list? Uh, if I'm sure the person is there and the cemetery has no records, um, th this is a big problem with a lot of the Negro League um, players, uh, especially in southern states, although not exclusively in southern states. Um, we had the cemetery in town, but that's just for the white folks. And well, okay, the black folks need a cemetery too. We'll give you this land over here, which is usually about the swampiest, messiest land in the city. And they give them that for the cemetery with no funding to take care of it. So there's enthusiasm at the start. The cemetery is reasonably well cared for. But then the people who are enthusiastic die. And their grandkids don't feel like taking care of it. And so when they're cleaning out grandpa's house, they toss the box with the records. Um, I, I had one in, in Georgia where, oh, yeah, we don't have any records before 1995. Oh, okay, I've heard of fires, floods. No, that wasn't it. City Hall was being renovated. And when it was being t stuff taken out of the old part into the new part, one guy saw a box and he just threw it out without bothering to check what it was. And it was all the cemetery records prior to 1995. So they have zero idea where anybody is. But if, if I've got enough information, I'm 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 sure that the guy is there. Uh I will try walking the cemetery, but if it's 300 acres, um, that's just not realistic. So in those cases, I just say sort of I surrender, he's here someplace. Um for, for the most part, I've, I've found everybody that I thought I had any kind of reasonable reason to be, to be able to find. All right, good. Excellent. So I was thinking what we would do is I just had a really brief uh, PowerPoint here just so that if you aren't familiar with how to use it on your phone to how cool this is. Um, obviously, Fred, you've seen these already, so um, you don't need to use it unless you're trying to go back to it. But <laughs> Same kind well, of I'm showing it to a, a colleague today on my phone. I said, here, look, this is what I'm going to be talking about today. <laughs> so I think there might have been a question. How do you access the map? What we're going to be doing is I need to work with Jacob to make sure that we get it onto the Baseball Landmarks Committee landing page. So that's going to have the information there. Um, at the end, I'll have the address up too, or if anybody wants it, email, uh, email me and I'll send it out. But um, what we're trying to do, what we've been really successful in doing with the Sabre baseball map, which you could see here, is just trying to get it so that if you go on to Google and you type in Sabre baseball map, it should bring it up. And that's what we're hoping to get with the Graves map, too. I don't know if it's working yet on my phone or not, but I just went ahead and for my phone, I made myself a little bit of a, what do you call that? I just put it. I don't know if you could see it. I put it, I don't know, on the screen as the M. So whenever I need it, I just hit that and it opens up. So you can always do that, add it to your homepage or whatever. If you're not familiar with how the baseball map works itself or the Graves map now, they're very similarly set up and formatted. You could use it on your laptop or PC, on a tablet, on your smartphone. Um, if you have it on your laptop or your PC, just bookmark it and you could access it whenever you want and on your home screen on your phone, and then you just go to it. So the map itself, if you have your phone in portrait view straight up and down, um, you're able to see the map as it looks here. If you go on your phone and you hit with your finger each one of those blue buttons, the 1944 will get zoomed in and it'll go to much more of a number of buttons and you keep pressing till you get to wherever you want to be. You can also do this thing where you spread your fingers and it'll zoom in if you close your fingers together, just like 
using your phone regularly, it'll um, zoom out. So as far as the uh, way, if you look at it on landscape view, you turn your phone sideways. This one will give you on the lower left-hand corner the, the plus and minus. If you want to use the plus and minus there to zoom in or zoom out, instead of using your fingers to press or spread or whatever, that's fine. And this will also open up the search bar at the top. So if you want to search Chicago, or if you want to search for Bankhead or whatever it might be, you put that up in the search box and you'll be able to find what you're looking for. As far I as did, use, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I did just type Saber Graves Map in Google and it brought it, it, it did give it as the third option. Okay, good. So I'm just hoping the more, I don't know how all that stuff works, but I think the more we all search for it by using the Google search, it'll hopefully populate pretty quickly as, as the top option. But in terms of using it on your phone, if you go to the, uh, the map, and obviously you'll see along the right-hand side there is those three little bars for menu. If you hit that, you'll get these three options, the magnifying glass, these two points with a line between them, and then the uh, wrench and screwdriver. The search function, you hit the magnifying glass, and on your phone, when you hit the search function, this will open up that search bar at the top there. If you type in something, say for instance, you're like, I wanna find where Ernie Banks is. Like we looked at before on the PC or laptop version, this will now bring you to that box on your phone. You could do the same thing here. If you hit Street View, if there's a photograph of it, it'll show you a photograph of the grave. And if you hit the opening Google Navigate box there, the picture that's shown all the way on the right here, it says opening Google Maps and you see cancel or open. As long as you have Google Maps as an app on your phone and you hit open, this is gonna give you turn-by-turn -turn directions to that grave. So this morning I was down in Edwardsville, Illinois for business. I opened up this and I wanted to figure out how long it would take for me to get to Ernie Banks's grave. Where I was at that point and the traffic at that point was four hours, 45 minutes. But as you can see on the map on the right-hand side here, it doesn't just take you to the cemetery. Those turn-by-turn -turn directions will literally take you directly, whoops, sorry about that will take you directly to that grave. I don't know if you if you remember, this is the same cemetery that we looked at earlier, Graceland Cemetery, you know, just north of Wrigley Field. And if you wanna go while you're here, you look back at the map and you're like, oh, William Hulbert's here too, or uh, Carruthers is here too. You can look at each of those individually and it's gonna literally take you from gravesite to gravesite throughout those roads. Uh, Sean Kaloje is on the call. We did this, tested it out before Sabre 51, and it worked like a charm. It is unbelievable. It takes you from point to point. And basically, what we're trying to do now is figure out what's next. Uh, I know Fred has seen a ton, like more than you would think is even humanly possible in person. But I know there are portions of the country, right, that you really kind of have either underreported or maybe haven't gotten to yet. What kind of kind of gaps in, in your research are there? Well, Northern California, uh, which would include Colma. Uh, Colma has something like 2,000 residents and 2 million graves because San Francisco doesn't allow burials in, in the city. So everybody from San Francisco gets buried there. Holy Cross Cemetery there has something like 55 graves of ball players, uh, Joe DiMaggio, Frank Rossetti, a bunch of others. Um, the, I, I, in Washington and Oregon, I've done the very, very, very eastern edge. So most of those states I haven't done in large portions of Pennsylvania and New York State. The, the other states I have at least at one point visited all the known graves. But like I said earlier, folks keep dying, get buried places I've already been. So, yeah, and so that's going to help us kind of fill in the gaps now, at least as far as the map is concerned, is to add additional grave sites for places that Fred hasn't been. And obviously, as time marches on and more people pass away, like Brooks Robinson just the other day, you know, it's one of those things where 
this will be a living project where we're trying to add as many grave sites as possible. One of the nice things too about this map is that there's so much room on it to add everybody. We want to be as inclusive as possible. Um, you know, Fred, like you mentioned, if there are even people that are, you know, associated with Sabre that we feel might be worthy of being on the map, like you said, Bob Davids was, right, before? Right. You know, you know I think that that's a fantastic thing. I didn't know that that was something you had done, but I, I think that's definitely something that we should make sure is on the map, right, so that we honor the people that have contributed, you know, in, in certain ways to Sabre. Um, I know you don't want to add your photos and so forth, but we would like to have photos. So for anybody that's out there that's visited any sites, um, are going to be visiting in the future, you know, we have some photographs on the map for um, the, the, the main map, um, but we want to have as many as possible. So um, I know this will be a daunting task. There's a lot of pictures to add, but it's something that um, obviously we would like to have eventually. Um, like I said earlier, we'd like to link Sabre bios. So if the person that is buried at that specific gravesite has a Sabre bio, we'd like to make sure that it's linked right in that pop-up box. So if you hit the name, it goes right to the bio. Um, I mentioned too about differentiating the map markers and brainstorming how best to do that. And one of the things I didn't put on here too is, I don't know how many of you have uh, visited Hardball Voyager, but that's the blog for the Landmarks Committee. And this would be one of those great ways for you to share that you visited a cemetery and maybe you visited several graves there, or maybe you've made a trip to see one grave. We just wanna see your pictures. Maybe you have some personal connection to the individual that was buried there, but we would love to just get information from you, a story from you. It could be as, as little as a sentence or two or a full-blown research article about the different places that you've been and grave sites you've seen. So that's kind of what we're hoping is going to happen as we go further with the project. One problem that you have with that last thing that you had mentioned there, uh, differentiating between the Hall of Fame, that was obvious. But if uh, if you want to differentiate between, say, managers and players, you got a whole bunch of people who are both. Right. The, the way I've done it with mine is if they were a player, I list them as a player. So Walt Alston, Hall of Fame manager, is listed as a player because he had that one at bat where he struck out. Connie yeah. Mack, Connie Mack, I have listed as a player because they 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 played. Yeah, and that's one of the things too that we're trying to figure out how to make better on the flagship map is adding some kind of tags so that each of the sites or um, individuals that are honored with a statue or whatever. You're going to be able to say, for instance, you go to uh, Durham Athletic Field. It's not only a historic ballpark, but it's also a filming location for you know Bull Durham. Or oh. you go to Rick, Rickwood Field in Alabama. It's not only just the historic ballpark, but it's also the place where there's at least a couple of historical markers around it too. So that all of that information is going to be available, you know, at your fingertips. So um, the address for the map here, I mean. That's about as good as it gets. It would be nice if it was just sabergravesmap.com, but because we work through this map div to do the mapping, um, this is kind of how it is. So I'm hoping that eventually, if you are able to find it, like I said, make sure you you know bookmark it on your computer or add it to the homepage on your phone. That way it's always ready to go. And basically at this point, if you have questions, um, let us know. Um, Saber you, do two, you do have two people who've raised their hands. Yeah, I was just, I just wanted to get through this last one. And oh, well, I'm sorry. Okay. Questions. Yeah. So, um, I just wanted to mention if anybody here is on Twitter, we are on Twitter or whatever it's called now at Saber Landmarks. If you are visiting graves, if you're visiting any landmarks and you have a photograph, put it up, tag us, and we'll retweet it. We'd love to see that stuff. So, but if you have any questions, you know, let me or Chris or Mark know. So I just wanted to kind of open it up to questions at this point. I know that there's some in the chat. I don't know if there's any here that you haven't answered yet, right? Um, 
I, I think the chat I dealt with those. Okay. I think. All right. So if anybody has a question, uh, feel free to pop in. I think there I see a couple of hands raised here. Uh, hi, this is Susan in um, Tennessee. And as you were talking about trying to keep up with um, um, the locations, um, I was wondering if if it might not be productive to have people assigned to the more current um, uh, burials. Uh, and as long as they're fresh, it would be sort of like low hanging fruit. Um, and maybe you could have a small subcommittee that would keep up with that, uh, the newer uh, burials. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that I'm hoping to do in our follow-up email here is kind of brainstorm on how to best have this go forward and be as accurate as possible. For instance, with regard to the photographs, the way that MapDiv uses them, it has to be in a specific format and it has to be hosted by a third party that'll put it in that format. So we've set up an Imgur account. I know some of you may have used that already to put photographs on the main map, but we're gonna have to do the same thing here. So I was hoping there might be volunteer or volunteers who will help format photographs for people and get them in a in a in the formatting that we need to put it onto this map too. But in terms of getting people involved, that's what we're looking for is to ask people, Susan, I hope maybe you would be interested in um volunteering to be somebody that you know will help with you know new people that have passed away and figuring out where they might be buried. Some of it will be a little bit different because if you're not in a geographic area and you can't actually go and visit it in person, that would be great. But um, whatever we can do to help filter it down to whoever can help out is, is going to be great. So um, if you're in an area like Pennsylvania, like Fred said, or in the Pacific Northwest or Northern California that really needs help, those are the places that we would like to go to. So um, I'll be sending One out problem. probably in the next week or two some kind of uh, form so that everybody can kind of volunteer in whatever way they can, so. One, one problem that we're having with some of the more recent ones is the increasing popularity of cremation, which means that sometimes uh, there may eventually be a burial, but it might not be for four, um, you know, four or five years. Um, Bob Housen, who was the engineer of the Big Red Machine uh, years ago, um, he was listed as being in a cemetery in Denver, but the cemetery in Denver said he wasn't there. I was fortunate to be able to find his son's phone number, and I called his son, and we had a wonderfully delightful talk. He was really very happy to uh, help me, and um, you know, we, we talked for a while about him canoeing on the Buffalo River in Arkansas. We had, we had a great conversation, and he said, oh, yeah, he, um, we have his ashes here. Uh, we're waiting until... My mother passes away, and once she's passed away, then we will take care of them. Uh, and I, I never did call back and ask, how's your mom doing? Because I didn't want to sound really sort of tacky. Um, eventually, she did pass away, and now they are in that spot in that cemetery. But sometimes we don't we don't know. And then four or five years later, they may finally do something. And that doesn't get the publicity of when they die. Right. That that That's a problem sometimes. Yeah. Okay, looks like Sam, you've got your hand raised. Yeah. Um, first off, I, I this uh this came out, uh this map came out right when I was in Charleston, South Carolina and preparing to drive back to Pennsylvania. So I hit um probably about a good half dozen cemeteries along the way. And and this thing got me within about five feet of, of every marker that I was looking for. So just a, a wonderful tool. I'm really glad to have that. Um, I did have a question of how we can contribute names, like just basically how do we contribute new names? And if we notice errors, like there was a, a bunch of names in Virginia where there are duplicate entries. So who do we contact to you know, report that stuff? Okay, so what we'll do is with the email that goes out to follow up on this will be a Google form, a Google sheet that is going to give us information on adding new people or individuals to it or telling us about errors. And I'll go through the instructions with that, but we have one already in place for the, the actual map or the uh, flagship map. And it seems to work pretty well. 
So yeah, hope you're able to take care of it that way. All right, uh, Dixie, you got your hand raised? Yes. <clears throat> Fred, I yes. wonder if you could tell us uh, when you graduated from maybe taking a pleasant drive down a long road to find one, maybe two graves, and suddenly you found yourself on a full out attack of trying to do five or six graves in a day. Uh, well, most I've ever done in a day is something like 67. But <laughs> how is there enough time to do that? Well, sometimes I, um, if there's a large national cemetery, uh, when I was in California, there, um, Riverside National Cemetery, there are a bunch there and there are a bunch of others close. When I was in the Boston area, I mean, if I'm in Texas, I visit a grave hour and a half to the next cemetery to visit two more graves, 45 minutes to the next one to visit one grave, two hours to the next cemetery. In Boston, 21 graves in this cemetery five minutes to the next cemetery where there are 18. So in some cases, now, when did, it, when did I graduate? Uh, as the distances got farther, it didn't make sense to drive to Dallas to do a couple graves and come home that night. It, it's a three-hour drive for me. Well, it was a three-hour drive back then. Uh, and so I'm not going to do six hours of driving in one day to visit seven graves. So I'll, I drove to Dallas, spent the night, got as many as I could around the Dallas area, then went home. And so as the distance got farther, uh, I started spending the night. And when I decide I'm going to try to get Ohio, um, I could take a bunch. Of, I mean, I, I did Mississippi in two weekend trips. But Ohio, I can't get a productive weekend trip. So during the summer, we're going to be on the road for a while. And my wife needs to be commended in all this. She has been with me for most of this. And she's confined to a wheelchair now. She had a a uh, major stroke nine and a half years ago, and she still puts up with this. Uh, a couple of years uh, on the Ohio trip, when we did the nine weeks, 17,000 miles, um, she was on the phone talking to a friend and I had it on speaker, and I could hear them, uh, the person say, Beth, are you enjoying the trip? And I'm thinking, oh, no, this isn't going to be good. But she said yes. She she in, she enjoys it. She gets to sightsee. She always likes to travel. Um, and yeah, so we we do that. I know Donna's been waiting patiently to ask a question, but her raised hand blends in with her background real well, so it's hard to see that. Yeah, it looks like that was the last one I was just about to call. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, Donna. I was going to um, suggest or, or offer an, a combination suggestion opinion um, about the color coding on the map. Um, and I personally like the idea of Hall of Famers versus non-Hall of Famers and leaving the color coding at that because you're going to have people that fall into multiple categories and then just like an idea of having multiple categories that you can assign kind of like when um, if you're on the flagship map and you say, oh, I want to see every I want to see all the minor league ballparks so we can figure out what the right categories are and have a single person be able to be assigned to multiple of those categories without touching the color coding. Just make it something searchable. Yeah, see, that that's the problem is the way that the map works is in order to make it searchable and clickable by categories. It makes them different colors that way. So oh. that's that's the limitation is that we're not able to do subcategories. Yeah. You mentioned about tagging. Maybe we could do it that way somehow. I, I think so. I think, and that's something that we talked about doing for the flagship map too, is tagging somehow. But in order to do that, we need to add another column to the giant database. And when we've tried to monkey with things a little bit, it threw everything off. So there's a there's a little bit. I, I don't claim to be like a hundred percent computer literate. The map div is relatively turnkey, but it does take a little tweaking. So, but these are all things that I'm hoping that we'll get figured out. So, thanks. Yeah, there's there's a question in the chat. What about players buried outside of the United States? Um, the only one I've been to. Well, and I haven't been to any. The only one I contributed to you was the one in England that my friend visited for me. Um, there, there are enough in the United States, and I'm getting old enough that I don't know how much longer I can keep doing this. Um, I'm 65 now, so I don't think 20 years from now, I don't think I'm going to be doing this anymore. But 
so there, there's still enough in the United States that I don't know that I'm going to get to Puerto Rico or Cuba. Now with Cuba, um, oh, is it Kit Krieger who does the Cuba trips? I think so. I don't, I don't know if you can get um, this kind of information from him. I know he takes people to some of the uh, cemeteries in Cuba. I don't know if he's collected the GPS GPS data or not. Yeah, I know that uh, Ralph Carhart, who wrote the book, um, The Hall Ball, mm -hmm. visited all of the Hall of Fame graves with a single baseball. And I know he traveled to Cuba. I'm not sure if he coordinated that with somebody there or not, but um, mm -hmm. I know he was able to see some there. And I think, I don't know if he solved the mystery of where Cristobal Torrienti is buried or not. I think there's some question whether it's New York or Cuba. I'm not sure exactly if that's been solved yet, but... Well, I, I I have him on my list as being in an unmarked grave in New York. Yeah, okay. Steve Thornley was there as well. The cemetery says he's there. Yeah. Um, there, There's one that's actually interesting in Arkansas. We've got one guy who apparently is buried in two different cemeteries. Uh, Al Williamson was apparently married twice. And I'm, my guess is half of his ashes are with one wife in one cemetery and the other half are with the other wife in the other cemetery. Oh. That's crazy. I don't remember which one I have listed in the data that I gave you. <laughs> Possibly both. Maybe, yeah. All right. Anybody else have questions, either of the map itself or the committee itself or a Fred? You know, I don't have so much. Well, I guess it's a question. Uh, well, first off, Fred, I'd like to thank you for sharing all your information. It's, wow, it's kind of overwhelming. It's great. Um, I'm just curious, um, you know, how you, um, do you just read a lot of obituaries to get all the information, like where these people are buried? Uh, are Lee they, Allen. Like the process you do? Yeah, Lee Allen was the official historian of Major League Baseball back in the 30s, 40s, something like that. And he decided that we needed to know where all these guys were born and died and all that. And he did incredible work to get all that now not all his information is right some guy named john smith played one game for troy in 1876 and he found a john smith and you know, it just wasn't the right one but he, he did a great job and then uh for the cemeteries uh bill lee uh bob bailey and others went to all the dusty historical archives in every state capital i think and looked up obituaries. So they did that. So most of the work is already done. Uh, when I'm getting ready to go someplace, I email Bill Carl, the uh, Biographical Research Committee chair. And I say, hey, give me all the people who are buried in Missouri. And I get an email back from him with what we believe are all of the ball players buried in Missouri. Now, limitation to his data, he, he only does players. And so far, that committee doesn't have the Negro League players. And right now on my data, I've got Negro League differentiated from Major League, even if they played in one of the leagues that is now recognized as Major League, because I just haven't taken the time to merge that. Um, I go to Gary Ashwill, and he's got a database that gets me a lot of those players. Uh, I go to RetroSheet because they include managers, coaches, and umpires. I've never found a good place to get all the uh, All-American Girls Professional Baseball League data. There are a bunch of, I know, Sam, I believe you've got a bunch of those. Um, but they, they I, I tried contacting them, and the, I, I think it's probably just volunteer website, and they didn't ever respond. Uh, those are, are tough. And the Negro Leagues are tougher because they just didn't keep records like Lee Allen did. And I did visit Lee Allen when I was in Florida, so he is one of the ones that is included. Anybody else? All right. Well, Fred, this has been awesome. Thanks for sharing kind of your origin story with us. And more importantly, thank you for sharing all of the information with us. I'm hoping that maybe with the help of committee members, maybe your grave searching in the future might be helped a little bit by finding where the ones that you haven't visited yet are located and we'll kind of help you out there, right? <laughs> I, I, that, that it would be absolutely fine with me. Yeah. <laughs> Any, anything that makes it easier for me is good yeah but it's it's been an unbelievable resource 
I, I always like to tell people that regardless of what I'm doing, I'm probably checking the Saber baseball map. And now I'm checking the Saber baseball graves map to see if when I'm in business or going somewhere for the weekend or traveling here or there, or maybe just trying to decide whether to take a day trip. If there's something baseball related, I can see whether it's a historical site or statue, historical marker. And now the graves has just been opened up tremendously. It is crazy how much information there is and how easy it is to get from place to place. And using the map now in its format on my phone to be able to just hit it and it takes you right there to the next one. I mean, if you've got that on your phone and you're in your car, it hooks up to the screen on your car. And next thing you know, you're standing at Ernie Banks' grave. It's just amazing. So can't thank you enough for sharing it and uh, you know trusting the, the Landmarks Committee with all your information. Realize that trying to visit some of them could get you arrested for trespassing if you're not careful, because there are uh, several that are on private property. Yeah. yeah. Always be careful. <laughs> we will never um, encourage anybody to break the law. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Take it easy. And like I said, um, expect a an email in the next week or so with some more information to follow up and information on how to add and volunteer sheets and so forth. And we'll try and get this map to be as robust as possible. And help Fred out on his future travels. Thank you so much. Take it easy. All right, bye.